You know, when you've got somebody who's more ideological, I mean, my viewpoint of Bill Gates, just from what I've seen, of course, I've never met him or had a conversation with him, but my my viewpoint on him is that he's an ideologue when it comes to vaccines. He really believes, and I, you know, and I don't know what his motivation is behind that. I know that, you know, what we do know is that, for example, when he did meet with, when he had meetings with like Jeffrey Epstein, he was looking for the conversations we know factually was that he was looking for a Nobel Prize. You know, he wanted to somehow kind of be, you know, because the guy has all the money in the world. So maybe he wants to be uh, revered. He wants to be, you know, worshipped in a way or looked at as a savior of some kind. So I don't know if that has to do with why he seems to push vaccine so much, but he certainly has a lot of the money. And that, so, and then you're saying like NIH, of course, and, and NIAID, uh, having a lot of the funding. So it comes down to money. So you just think that everybody was like, we just have to do what we have to do for money. We can't cut off all the other funding for all this other important research we're doing. We just go along with this. Yeah, so if you do research on, let's say, AIDS, so if you do research on uh, pneumococcal disease, uh, you 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 will, uh, you will understandably think that that is important research and you don't right. want to jeopardize that research, so it's easy to keep quiet. I don't uh, I don't blame them for doing that. So uh, no, it's just that how do we change that system? You know how exactly. how is it? How can universities and our scientific labs and I mean, and this is like the problem everywhere. I mean, this is a problem even in politics, like even in our political, you know, we we elect these people that we think are going to finally make change. But then it, it comes at, it comes down to, I think, an individual decides and they say, I've got this pet project, this pet thing that I'm really, that I've spent my entire career on, or it's like my, you know, the, the torch I carry. And I'm not going to throw that away. This, the, my big thing, I'm not going to throw this away for this other thing that I don't, that is not my, you know, I, I can just go along for now just because I need the money. And we see that, um, I think in all industries, but how do we even make that change? How else could a university be funded to where maybe we could avoid these types of things? So I think we have to decentralize uh, uh, the funding of science. So we actually saw during the pandemic that some of the best studies, important studies that came out early on was not from the powerhouses of the US and the UK, but from smaller countries like Denmark, uh, Sweden, Iceland, Israel, and Qatar, where they have a little bit more independence in terms of the research funding. There are still high, li high level scientists there, but they're not, uh, they don't depend on Fauci, for example, mm -hmm. or, or Gates uh, to that extent. So some of the best research came from that. So I think we have to decentralize how science operates in the US. So instead of having one NIH or one National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, we could have uh, six of them regional throughout the country. And then maybe if one of them has a file as a director, uh, that's, that's too bad, but at least the other five one will function and, and can fund good research. Somehow decentralize it, yeah. What do you think, um, have you, do you, I, I don't know if you know, do you know Anders Tegnell? Do you talk to him at all? I have never met him and we only had a very brief uh, uh, email correspondence where I uh, uh, thanked him for his good work and uh, he has uh, responded in Swedish, thank you, tak. So I haven't so, had any, any, any further interaction with him on that, no. Oh, interesting. But I think I'm um, a big admirer of, of what he did in Sweden, so. He's, right. he, and he's a very brave person because he stood up uh, to the international pressure. He had a lot of support within the country from the uh, epidemiological community. Uh, but uh, internationally, uh, Sweden was hammered. And uh, I guess politicians in other countries were sort of afraid because if it, they, they usually want everybody to do the same thing because then if it goes bad, then nobody's to blame, right. basically, because everybody did the same bad thing. So if there's now a control group of Sweden who did it uh, based on the principles of public health, uh, then all the other countries look bad. And that's exactly what happened. All the other countries now look really bad. Why do you think Sweden was able to be that control group, that outlier? Not like Sweden meant to be a control group, but yeah, Anders Tegnell, who was the epidemic. So what was his position? Uh, how does Sweden work with this? Because I, from my understanding, so Anders Tegnell is an epidemiologist. He was the lead the the head epidemiologist that's in charge of 
health policy in Sweden? How does that work? Yeah, sort of the state technologist, uh, sort of equivalent to the head of the CDC. So responsible okay. for public health uh, uh, and yeah. Now, why why do you think Anders Tegnell, as like the equivalent of the head of the CDC in Sweden, why do you think he was able to to be to to go down a path that was completely different from other nations versus like the head of our CDC? So he had very uh, good experience from uh, public health and epidemiology and infectious disease. And he worked in Africa for a few years where. Uh, infections sort of occur very naturally and something you deal with on a, on, a, on a regular basis. So I think that helped. He has strong support from other epidemiologists in Sweden, including a former, uh, his former boss and a former uh, state epidemiologist, uh, Johan Giesecke. I think he was very influential, uh, a very intelligent and smart man. Uh, and also the politician left them alone more, I think, than in other countries. So. Uh, Sweden has a tradition of where politicians will not micromanage uh, these things. But I also think it helped that uh, the prime minister, a social democrat, he actually uh, uh, is from the working class. He's a welder. And I think there was that component in all countries that we were basically protecting the laptop class, young professionals. uh, lawyers or or bankers or scientists or young journalists like you right. uh, uh, who can work from home and we were through the working class under the bus. Totally. Because they still had to go there and collect the garbage and make sure that the electricity works and uh, and so on. So uh, They had to work I at think- the grocery stores and they had to deliver our food and they had, I mean, it was just such a, it was such a, it made zero sense. Oh, lockdown, but only lock down the people who can afford to stay locked down while we make everybody else continue to go out there. I mean, it just, yeah, it's infuriating how nonsensical the whole thing was. Yeah, so this you lockdown, think that- I think, was the biggest assault on the working and middle class in the U.S. since the segregation and the Vietnam War. And yeah. also for children, uh, I mean, the governor of uh, uh, California, he closed down the public schools, but he sent his own kids to private schools. So the, the wealthy, they uh, could use private schools or pod schools or tutors. And I'm very happy for those children because they needed that. But uh, uh, middle class and uh, working class kids, they didn't have that. They had suffered the most. Yeah. So the fact that the Swedish prime minister was from a working class person, I think that actually helped. He, uh, yeah. he could sort of understand intuitively understand that uh, concept much more easily. Right. When you look at the other leaders around the world, the other Western leaders, most of them are not coming from that sort of background, that background themselves. Maybe their grandparent was something or maybe their parent was something, but they themselves had always been pretty privileged. And so they didn't really fully grasp it. What do you think? um, So Sweden got a lot. Where is Anders Tegnell now? Is he still in charge? No, he stepped down, I think, a year or two ago. Uh, but he's still working in public health. So, I remember when when Sweden for and I was a big fan of the Swedish model and it, and people it was hilarious to hear a lot of even people who claim to be leftists like even social democrats here in the United States and they were totally against because it was more of the left that was pushing a lot of this stuff than the right. And it, what was so funny to me was that so many on the left, including myself, have always been very. Um, very interested in the Swedish model, the Swedish economic and political model. I think it's one of the best in the world. And uh, and many have always been like, oh, if we could just be like Sweden, if we could just be more like Sweden. But then when it came to COVID, it was suddenly, no, Sweden is a pariah nation. And uh, and they were even calling Sweden a libertarian's you know dream. You know? <laughs> like this country was somehow had turned full on right wing libertarian because Sweden said, and I remember following and they were saying, well, you know, the, it wouldn't it would be anti-democratic to lock everybody down. That's like against democracy. And we're just going to follow the science and we're going to give recommendations. Sweden just ended up getting really, really raked over the coals on this one. Uh, I, and I remember Anders Tegnell saying in an interview, well, we'll find out in three years. It'll be about yeah. three years and we'll find out. Right. And I already know. They have the, uh, Sweden has the lowest excess mortality among major Western countries. 
Really? So, yeah, that's, so how? That's the, and that's the ultimate measure because it measures both the death from COVID as well as death from the collateral damage uh, for like cardiovascular disease and mental health and, uh, uh, and, and so on. I mean, some of that is not counted yet because, for example, cancer, when, when the people don't get this cancer screening or the cancer treatment, that doesn't mean that they're going to die of cancer three months later. It usually means that they might die five years from now instead of 15 years from now. So we still have many, a lot of that uh, collateral damage that we haven't seen in the mortality statistics yet. But e even though uh, uh, the, the excess mortality is the right measure to sort of compare compare with. Also, it's, it's hard to fudge because you can define a COVID death somewhat differently, uh, but uh, a dead person is a dead person. So usually most countries have very reliable statistics for the total number of deaths. In the beginning, Sweden had a lot higher rate of COVID infection, hospitalizations and deaths, and people were comparing Sweden to Denmark, for example, or Norway. Um, so now, how do they compare to those specific nations now? So uh, the other Scandinavian countries, Denmark, Sweden, uh, Norway, Iceland, and uh, Finland, they uh, they were influenced by the Swedish approach. So they fairly quickly moved towards a much more less lockdown. They did close the schools uh, for the kids in, uh, uh, in the spring of 2020, but they opened them quickly. So uh, they, they they would have they didn't do the harsh lockdowns that we saw, for example, in the U.S. or in uh, in the U.K. and other countries. And it they also so turned, they also turned out uh, so in terms of excess mortality, they are also at the lower end of the spectrum. Yeah. Well, I know Norway. Norway did, I think, a lockdown for two weeks. They said, "Okay, we'll do the two weeks thing," and they did like two weeks, and then said, "Okay, that's it. <laughs> We're not doing it anymore." That's from what I understand it. Maybe you have different information on that. But I think Norway did it for just a brief period of time and then said, OK, we did it. It didn't work. We're not doing that again. Iceland, from my understanding, never did. A, they didn't do any of that. They did close their board. Their borders were um, if you got in when you got into the country, you had to isolate for like 10 days or something before they'd let you loose throughout Iceland. But I don't think Iceland did any of the other measures. Then again, they're an yeah, island. I don't so think they closed to, the, the kids went to school there throughout in Iceland. Yeah. Um, Denmark, though, definitely seemed to be more in line with the rest of Europe. Uh, they they seem to do more of them. They seem to, to go along. And I don't know. Or, you know, it was that maybe that was just political talk because of their prime minister at the time. I don't know if it was or if they really, truly uh, went along with, you know, more in line with Germany. Maybe it's their proximity to Germany. I mean, I'm not sure what. But how did Denmark fare in comparison? Uh, they did fairly well in excess mortality, and I think that they had much less than, for example, Germany. Uh, but uh, in the spring of 2020, the epidemiologists of Denmark wanted to follow a similar approach to Sweden, but the politicians sort of stepped in and uh, and, uh, and imposed more stricter measures. So there was the conflict there where the epidemiologists wanted to do more the Swedish approach. Why do you think the epidemiologists there were not as able to uh, be shielded from the politics as as in Sweden? Um, I think maybe because of the nature of the politicians, but also uh, of the of a tradition that in Sweden uh, the ministers will not micromanage uh, mm. these things. And in Denmark, they didn't really have that as much. Maybe I don't think they have that same strong tradition for that. Um, mm. Um, that's too bad. Uh, I mean, it would have been nice to see more countries. I, I think quite a few. Uh, do, do we have other examples besides Sweden of nations that followed along more along the that that we could all, that could kind of serve as a control group now that we're four years after the pandemic and really can assess it? Uh, well, so first, I should also say that it wasn't that Sweden did nothing. Sweden actually did a lot to protect older people in Sweden. So, uh, uh, and I think that was very, very important to, to mm -hmm. do that. Uh, Sweden didn't do perfect, but for example, in Stockholm during the spring of 2020, there were a lot of deaths in the nursing homes and that's uh, partly due to too much staff rotation. You don't want to have a lot of staff rotation when a big pandemic is ongoing. You want to each, you have one each of these older people to be exposed to as few people as possible. 
So it wasn't that Sweden did nothing, but I think it's also interesting to compare the U.S. because in the beginning, everybody sort of did very similar, but then uh, later on, there were uh, 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 there were differences. For example, South Dakota did much less lockdowns versus North Dakota. Uh, and they are right next to each other. And in terms of uh, COVID death and mortality, they are very similar. So basically, the lockdowns of North Dakota didn't do anything that uh, uh, gave them any better results than South Dakota. We can also right. compare Florida and California uh, on COVID mortality. And uh, Florida has the age of the COVID mortality in Florida is, uh, is less than in California, uh, even though uh, Florida, after initial lockdowns in the spring, they sort of avoided that and kept schools open and so on, while uh, California has some of the harshest lockdowns in the country. And I would um, think, I mean, I don't know, I'd have to look it up, but I just anecdotally, just from what we know, I think Florida has a much higher age, um, like, you know, they've got a lot of old people who've retired to Florida. A lot of old people yeah, leave so California because it's expensive. Florida has the second oldest population in the U.S. after Maine, okay. but that's why you have to adjust for age. So they did even better if, once you adjust for age. No, what I said is after adjusting for age. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So once you adjust so, for age, Florida did well. So one example is, for example, Texas has a very young population. And if you don't adjust for age, the rate mortality, COVID mortality in Texas, I think, is lower than California, uh, than Florida. But if you adjust for age, uh, Texas did quite badly, actually, while Florida did really good. Why do you think that is? Uh, I don't know exactly why Texas did so badly, but they did lock down to a much larger extent than, uh, than Florida. Hmm. So they maybe were also, over. yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe they're, maybe they're more indoors than people in Florida. Maybe people in Florida are outside more. I don't know. Yeah. They also um, have different populations. So it's hard to, hard to know all of these things. 